whatever we might think of our duties regarding animals, whether we think we should not eat, hunt, trap, or otherwise harm them, or whether we think we may do so, whatever the right answers, these are the right questions. For like Noah, we must take responsibility for the fate of animals, especially when their fate is sealed by our decisions. In some ways, we are all Noah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That film clip you've just seen was Tom Reagan, who is known far and wide and around this earth now as uh, the number one advocate for animal rights, but more particularly for those of us in North Carolina. He is a professor of philosophy at North Carolina State, the winner of the Distinguished Teaching Award at NC State. He holds an alumni distinguished professorship and in recent weeks has won almost every major award that one can get, capped by the Crutch Medal from the Humane Society of North, of North America for his work in dealing with animals. And uh, Tom, it's just great to have you here. Uh, I noticed in reading that voluminous list of uh, publications that you've been turning out here and all these uh, lectures you've given, over a hundred of them I could count all over the United States. Uh, people are interested in this subject, aren't they? The animal? It is something to, to behold. In the time that I've been working on in the area, about 15 years, the changes have been just enormous. And, and there's not a day goes by now that I don't have a, an invitation to go someplace and give a talk or an interview with the media. It used to be that in order to get the media's attention, we'd have to knock on their door. And now what's happening is they're knocking on our door. So just in the past few weeks, uh, Time Magazine has called and the Chicago Herald Tribune, uh, newspaper from Portland, uh, just, it just is happening, uh, and uh, of all places, Town & Country Magazine is doing a, a major story on the animal rights movement. So I think we've, we're, we have seized the initiative, we've caught the imagination of people. People are, are beginning to hear what it is we've been saying, and I always tell activists is that people don't hear you when you're shouting at them. Uh, it's amazing, you think that they would hear better if you yell, but they don't. And so it's by carrying this, uh, uh, speaking softly, it seems to me, that we're commanding a new audience new attention. How did you first get interested in this? I'd be interested in knowing. What, what, what got you involved this way? Well, one's never quite sure, I think, when you kind of go back and try to analyze your own beginnings. But I think what happened in our case, anyhow, is that uh, to begin with, my wife and I were active in the uh, anti-war movement in the Vietnam era. And for some odd reason, it occurred to me that if I was going to be a, an effective activist on the platform, that I had better be a, a relevant scholar in the study. So I combined my uh, activism with scholarship, and I wrote and did research on topics like violence and aggression and war and, of course, nonviolence. In the course of doing the research on nonviolence, I read Gandhi. And it was as though Gandhi spoke to me from the pages. He said, look, uh, Tom Reagan, you're really concerned about violence uh, in terms of tanks and napalm and all this. What about that fork you've got in your hand? And I often say Gandhi was the first person who taught me that the fork is a weapon of violence, that here I had been so acculturated as to not even think that there was a moral question about eating animals. And, and he said that, again, speaking from the pages, uh, do you think that violence stops at the boundaries of your species? And well, no, I, you know, I think he had a point. So I began to think, that as my head was moving in a certain direction, but also just about that same time, um, my wife and family, we returned from a short vacation and to discover that our beloved dog had been hit that very day. And this dog had been our, our surrogate child uh, for 13 years. And, um, plunged us into enormous grief, as everyone who's watching this understands when you lose a companion like that, the, the grief period is real. And so my heart was opened up to a depth of feeling uh, that I hadn't realized that I had. And, and I thought, well, I guess I really do care about the pain and suffering of animals, not just this particular dog, but any dog or cat. And then once that, my heart started opening up uh, and my head was coming in this other direction, uh, there was no turning back. I've been, I've been a, on a roller coaster from then on. <laughs> well, I'm sure any time you state it as categorically as you have in your writings, you always incur opposition to this, but that's a part of the debate and the process, you say, in your 
idea opposition adoption as the process works through. But uh, you're pretty categorical about it. You, you said the total abolition of the use of animals in science, the total dissolution of commercial animal agriculture, the elimination of commercial sports hunting and fishing, I guess. But the, yeah. that's it. It's, huh? it's a tall order, that's for sure. <laughs> And, and yeah, it does encounter a lot of opposition. Uh, again, uh, respectful, increasingly respectful opposition. I, I'm pleased to say that, that um, people in Congress want to hear the arguments now. They're past uh, the point of kind of just shutting their mind down when they hear the ideas and others. They say, well, well let's, let's discuss this. And my own view of it is, is twofold, I think, uh, just in the simplest sorts of terms. One is that we share the earth with other biographical beings um, and not just there are these animals uh, uh, there are animals out there that are not simply biological entities but biographical entities they have a life that they experience they they bring this mystery of consciousness to their life and what we do to them matters to them and it matters to them whether it's whatever however useful it is to us and so anytime we harm them when we can avoid doing that then I think we incur a great uh, sense of wrong. Uh, we, we must take responsibility for that. Uh, we must begin to respect their integrity and their dignity and their life. And then, of course, when you say, well, if, if there are major institutions like uh, research on animals, the research community, uh, ag commercial animal agriculture, that are possible only if we treat these biographical beings as if they, they're, they're presence in the world is to serve our interest. And my own view is, and I've argued this in my writings, is that this is simply a, a, a paradigm of injustice. It's, it's, if it were a human population that was being forced into the service of the stronger, you know, if there was a weak human population being exploited by a stronger human population for the benefit of the stronger, we would categorically say injustice. But because we have tended not to see morality beyond the boundaries of our species, we don't see the injustice for what it is. But, so I, I, I'm challenging the whole structure of Western society, one might say. <laughs> and well, yeah, one, encounter, one encounters opposition. But as I, I read what you had written, uh, you move as a philosopher from uh, the uh, kindness, cruelty view, utilitarianism, uh, contract, uh, social contract in a sense, right. uh, but you come out at the point that uh, the issue of intrinsic value here as com animals, human beings, uh, right. it, and this is where you rest your case then? I think so, yeah. That what, I, what I believe is that just as uh, you don't exist as a resource for me, and, and if I treat you in that way, then I fail to treat you with respect. I, I violate your rights. So uh, these other biographical beings, if we, we do that, we, we treat them as merely of instrumental value, then we mistreat them. And so it is that common, shared, inherent value that we have with, with the other animals that we have to learn to respect. It's a tremendous challenge. I have a book that's, that's just come out in the last few weeks called The Struggle for Animal Rights, it's, and it's a more popular book than anything I've done so far. And in that book, I try to make the point that the struggle for animal rights is, is, involves this social struggle. It's the attempt to change existing social structures, which is enormously difficult. I mean, any progressive movement has encountered uh, the great challenge and has had to be persevere and be, try to be creative and find ways, opportunities for change. But the other part of the struggle for animal rights is the in individual struggle, the idea of, of individual change, not just social change. In fact, most of my friends, uh, are, they, they really are, are, want to see the world change. And, and, in uh, Nicaragua or in uh, um, South Africa or in Afghanistan or something, but it's somebody else's change that they like to see occur, you know, and the idea that, that there is this moral struggle that involves the struggle to change oneself, that's, I think, the great strength of our movement, that it, it's ethics up close and personal, and, and therefore it's meaningful, meaningful. Television can be an enormous ally to you. I know the scenes that showed the slaughter of the baby seals uh, provoked such a massive hostility to the practice that the Canadian government had to do something about it. Uh, is this happening uh, in other instances and applications? 
It does and it doesn't. Uh, uh, part of the problem, again, is this, the movement uh, lives and dies by the media. And, and so we, we obviously can't communicate with the public if we don't have access to the media. There's a great irony here because usually the, the media loves a plane crash. They love disaster and conflagration and confrontation and so on. So it's been a, a, a practice of the animal rights movement to get the media's attention by protesting and, and doing uh, disruptive things. Mm -hmm. and, and that has gotten the media's attention, but it also breeds this image of who we are that is false to the facts, I think, because they see us being uh, law-breaking or violent or angry or whatever. Uh, because that's what they come to see. In fact, the, the foundation of the movement uh, rests on the thoughts of people like Socrates and Thoreau and, and um, Gandhi again and Ruskin and Shelley and Browning and uh, Leonardo da Vinci. All these people have spoken out historically for the rights of animals. And so our great challenge is to bring the media to us on those terms rather than just waiting for, for us for protest and so on. And that is occurring, that is happening. So it's that combination of, of protest and affirmation of, uh, that I think is crucial. But again, the, the media is, is hard. I've had a hard time in this area, for example, with my film We Are All Noah having it aired in this area. Although it's, it won a, a national award, it's been shown in California, Louisiana, South Dakota, uh, throughout the United States. Millions of people have seen it, but it depends. You run into pockets of resistance along the way. The, the opening segment we saw here was from that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, now, where in the United States are you seeing people become really imaginative in dealing with this or really being creative about animal rights? Is there a particular area as against others or? Mm -hmm young people versus older, oh, those, those of us who are older, or what happened? I'm not sure what category I'd fall into <laughs> on that. But what, I, what I think we're finding is um, uh, there are certain areas where, where there's a, a kind of easy audience, as it were, and California certainly is one. Um, I have had a lot of opportunities to speak there, and, and, and there's, there certainly is a lot of responsiveness out there to, to the issues because there's a lot of environmental awareness, for example, and the animal rights issue is part of that larger environmental um, matter. But actually, the, the area that we think holds the greatest promise for blossoming forth is the triangle. And we, uh, on an annual basis now, do a, a series of events called Triangle Animal Awareness, and we do it at the end of September, the beginning of October. So we're done with it for this year and we're already planning for next year and we feel that the triangle is such a progressive area in so many respects that we can enrich that uh, reputation for being progressive that we should be known for things other than being the research triangle we should be perhaps known for being the compassion triangle too or something of that sort so we bring in, in uh, this past uh, series of events, we had the, the poet Galway Cannell, we had the legal theorist Christopher Stone, we had uh, Country Joe MacDonald from Woodstock fame, we had uh, uh, Coral Lansbury, the dean of graduate programs at Rutgers uh, to come, um, a, a series of, of people, an art show, um, uh, to try to bring uh, recognition, uh, try to educate the people in the triangle that there is a progressive cultural wing to the animal rights movement, but also to bring a kind of national recognition to the triangle. We're trying to create what we refer to as the Spoleto Festival for the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's got to be good for the triangle, and not just good for the animals. You speak about disciplined passion uh, as a way you measure the expression of your own commitment to the field or the expression of it. Uh, how widespread is the movement now? Do you have a national organization? A can I belong to something? Are the people right to you to join? What happened? Huh. Well, there are actually are just many uh, um, progressive organizations out there. And what, as a, what I had done for some odd reason, uh, again, I sometimes do things that end up being smart, even though I, I, I didn't think they were That's smart right. to begin with. But for some odd reason, I decided uh, that I would never belong to an organization, never put my name on letterhead, or you know, I'd donate some money and time, but never be officially associated with any organization. And I did that for about 14 years. And then it occurred to me that there was a hole in the movement. There was something missing. And it was the promotion of this cultural dimension of it. 
the poets and the, the dancers and the composers and the theater productions and legal theorists and fiction uh, literary people and so on. And that what we needed to do was to educate, as I say, the people to, to the resources that we have. I mean, think of the poetry that's favorable about animals. Think of the fiction favorable about animals. Think of the music favorable about animals. Just enormous uh, resources out there. Well, to focus that and also to encourage new, this current generation of, of creative people to add to that and then to perform it, to present it. So since nobody was doing it, uh, we decided that it was time that we actually, my wife and I, become members of an organization by founding one. And we do have a, a group called the Culture and Animals Foundation, which is international in scope. Um, the vice president is the, the dean at, at Trinity College at Cambridge University in England. It includes uh, illustrious people on its advisory board from Lily Tomlin to, uh, to uh, uh, Robert Bly, the poet. So we feel as though we have something new and something different and something important, again, uh, to offer to the animals and, and to the triangle in particular. Whole generation was raised knowing Lassie, you know. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it, 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 there is a tremendous uh, sympathy and empathy for animals in, in us. It's just that we, it sometimes sleeps, and uh, you might say our task is to waken it. Now I want to I shift a bit. Uh, you've won this outstanding teacher award, and you're a distinguished professor at NC State. Uh, what about this generation of students, Tom? Are you right up there up front with them on all that you're doing? Uh, how do you find these young people today? Well, I think that there are a lot, a lot of people that are fairly uh, uh, jaundiced about students today. Uh, they're apathetic or, you know, they, they don't care about things. Well, I'm not finding that. Uh, I, I think that we have gone through a, a generation that was, I think, Tom Wolfe characterized as the me generation. And that was the generation of conspicuous consumption. And if, if moral philosophy teaches us anything and, and religion teaches us anything, it is that a life that's built around the possession of material things is an empty shell of a human life. It's not, it can't go on because it's not satisfying. And I think that the past generation simply reconfirmed that ancient wisdom. I sense uh, in my students uh, at State and as I travel around, um, an awakening, uh, a restlessness, and a, and a growing forth, a burgeoning forth into what I characterize as the the generation, where in previously it was what can I do for me, and now it's what can I do for thee, where the thee is someone who is vulnerable and weak or needy, the homeless people, uh, the retarded, uh, the, the people in rest homes, uh, the, the animals, that's part of it, the, those who cannot stand up for themselves to claim decency on the part of those who can give it. Well, there's a whole generation coming along that, that I think is going to stand up and speak for them. So that, for example, in the animal rights movement again, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do uh, with our organization is to provide resources so that people can go out into the retirement villages and into the rest homes and into the nursing homes and talk to the people there about their problems, but also educate them about some of the problems that animals are having and say to the people, the older people who feel like they're no longer needed and no longer wanted and no longer valuable, hey, we need you. There's something important and good you can do. And here's what it is. And we try to enlist them, try to give them a sense of the to their life uh, where I think others are failing. So always we're looking for that opportunity to, to spread opportunities. So yeah, the students today are, are part of that rising tide of, of compassion. It's there, and it's just a question of uh, awakening it and focusing it. You find young people articulate in their expression of their attitudes about the lack of this kind of thing in government leadership or in corporate leadership. We've seen so much fraud, dishonesty, moral corruption. Uh, it's, they, they don't withdraw because of this, do they? They, they, they want to make the world, still want to make the world a better place, don't they? I think they do. I think they do. And again, what they are looking for are, uh, in the nature of the case, I think role models, people who, who can have a kind of integrity uh, that's not going to be corrupted by, by uh, material temptations, I mean, or the temptations of power and influence. And, and so it's, 
it really is a tremendous responsibility, I think, to teachers to understand that uh, there's more gets taught than what's said in a classroom. And so much depends upon the character that, that the teacher brings to that classroom and the character that the teacher takes out of that classroom. The students are learning uh, by watching, not just by listening. And, and so I, I think that if, if ever there was a, a, a particular time of importance for people in education, and maybe especially in higher education, it's today. Temple University has published two of your books that deal with uh, British philosopher G.E. Moore, who was apparently uh, quite an influence at the turn of this century. Uh, a word or two about him and his influence on society. You, you have written somewhere that I've read that uh, you felt he had more impact upon modern America, uh, maybe was part of the reason for the 60s uh, in the sense of what he taught and mm. the, uh, the throwing off of Victorianism in 1901, two, three, along there. Was he that much of a force? He was, uh, although at a subterranean level, as it were. There, uh, his writings are, are as boring as the day is long. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not anything that I would recommend an ordinary person to, to read Moore's work. He's just a very tedious and careful uh, analytic philosopher. And yet he had a profound influence on a particular group of artists and, and creative people called the Bloomsbury Group. And this was Virginia Woolf and Linton Strachey, John Maynard Keynes, uh, Duncan Grant, just a tremendous group very of talented powerful people. Group. Very powerful. Of course, they had a tremendous influence on, on the future course of 20th century history and, and the English-speaking world. Now, they claimed that Moore was their prophet, and they claimed that a particular book of his uh, a book called Principia Ethica, um, was their Bible. Now, philosophers, uh, that's what I am, philosophers have read the book as uh, one of those boring analytical treatises. You say page by page, it's a struggle. <laughs> it is a struggle. <laughs> and, and yet here is this uh, immensely talented uh, and intelligent group of people that found something else in it. So what I did um, when I was a fellow at the National Humanities Center here, was to try to unravel that mystery. How could they find in that book what uh, 75 years of philosophers had missed? Actually, more than that now, 80 years of philosophers had missed. And, and I think I, I found, uh, how, I think I solved the mystery. I'm not sure that everybody would agree with me, but I think I made a plausible case for what they found in it and why we had misread it as philosophers. And what is in that book is this uh, a declaration of individual freedom from convention, that is, you you can dress however you want to, and mm -hmm. if you know that's for you to decide. Uh, you can uh, have uh, sex however you want to; that's for you to decide. Um, just a tremendous amount of individual freedom as advocated by Moore, but also with that, of course, a great deal of individual responsibility. It's not that you can be; uh, uh, it's not anarchy that he's advocating, but a kind of uh, limited uh, freedom that he advocates. So if you look at the generations that came up in the 20th century and you think about the 60s as a, as a period of great experimentation with individual freedom, uh, with the un unleashed from convention, I think that there is a, a great deal of, of that boring analytic philosophy that underlies that. And, and at least that's, that's the kind of case I try to make in, the, in my book on war. Well, now, we've, we've been celebrating the birthday of the country and now the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Do you, do you feel there's been a real reawakening in the country as to those basic fundamental philosophical principles that have held us together for all these years uh, as you move around listening yeah. to people? And, well, I'm actually glad uh, you asked that because when you had asked about students earlier, I, it occurred to me that there was, was something that I wanted to say, and, and it, it's about students, and it involves the Constitution, in fact. And there is a young girl in California uh, named Jennifer Graham who in her biology class was required to dissect a frog. And she said, I'm not going to do this. I, I just think that I don't want to be a part to this. And they said, well, if you don't do this, you're going to get a lower grade. We're going to pen penalize you. She said, well, I guess you're just going to have to penalize me. And then the more she thought about it and her mother thought about it, thought, well, we're just going to take this thing to court on the basis of uh, the constitutional right 
of freedom of religion because, as you know, in the interpretation of the Constitution now, it doesn't have to be an article of a particular religious creed. It just simply has to function in your life in an analogous way. And so Jennifer just didn't want to harm anything, didn't be, to be part of that. And, well, that's where it is. It's in litigation now. And there's a, a, a commercial for a particular uh, computer that's being aired nationally involving Jennifer. And she talks about what happened to her. And there is a program for a computer called Operation Frog where you can dissect a frog on a computer screen. You don't have to actually cut up a frog. And she tells her story and says how, how she was not able to win the case at, this, at the level of the school when she was penalized. And she says, now I'm using my computer to study something else. And she says, constitutional law. And so <laughs> I think, yeah, there is. And, and one of the important things is this expression of, of students' rights in the classroom, and in particular, students' rights in the laboratory. We do think, those of us who, who want to try to represent the rights of animals, that the, there is too much emphasis, entirely too much emphasis, placed on dissection and vivisection in the undergraduate curriculum in the life sciences. And we think that it's possible to educate our students without